Do you feel like you're barely keeping your head above water? That no matter how hard you try, meaningful progress remains out of reach? Heather gets that. She battled an eating disorder for years before seeking help. Now in recovery, Heather is here to tell you that positive change is possible even when it doesn't feel that way. Join her as she shares openly about her struggles and small triumphs. Fair warning, though. Heather doesn't hold back. Her candid story may trigger some. But for those wanting honesty, hope, and healing, this is 1% Better with Heather. The information and stories shared on 1% Better are based on host Heather's personal experiences with eating disorders and mental health challenges. Heather is not a licensed doctor, therapist, dietitian, or other health professional. Her advice and opinions should not be taken as professional medical advice. Please consult your physician or a qualified health provider regarding any medical or health-related issues. 1% Better also contains descriptions of eating disorders that may be triggering for some listeners. Discretion is advised. Hey there, my little gaffers, and welcome to 1% Better with Heather. I am so excited for this next series of episodes. I will be interviewing Recovery Mom, as she's known on social media. I have a special connection with Recovery Mom. When I was at my sickest... I had a different social media account, and one day this woman popped up. I was immediately drawn to her. I fully believed that this was the universe trying to get my attention. I would watch her videos on loop all day long. She was around my age, she was fully recovered, and she had all the answers. From then on, she became my Yoda. There is no question you can ask her that she does not only have the medical answer to, but the mental health answer as well. She breaks everything down so eloquently with her sweet demeanor. She gives you your medicine with a spoonful of sugar. Recovery Mom is here to give back to the eating disorder community. She is the big sister you need. She has a heart of gold. And I'm privileged to call her my friend. Without any further ado, please welcome Recovery Mom. my little gaffers and welcome to 1% Better with Heather. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the stupid shit people say to us while we're in eating disorder recovery. First off, no one's not going to get a comment that they don't like. Should people make comments about you? No, no, especially when you're in recovery. It's the last thing you want to hear. But let's go through it and I'm going to tell you what happened to me and how I've dealt with it. So Right at the very beginning, when I was in the hospital, June 2022, I was hooked up to a feeding tube, every machine known a man, did not want to be there at all, but the rule was if anyone came to visit me, they weren't allowed to make comments about my appearance, how I looked, my plan that I was doing. Basically, we're supposed to talk about the weather and pretend that I'm not in the hospital fighting for my life at this point. And that those rules were made by the doctors because I did not want to be there. And the only way to keep me there that I agreed to this was I could have visitors whenever I wanted and I could have some coffee breaks and go outside and do that in the morning. Because I was on full bed rest. I was not supposed to be up walking around at all, right? But those were like my terms to go in there and they agreed. So when people would come visit me in the hospital, it was pretty good. Like no one really said anything to me. I, the people that knew that I was there were very few and far between. Like five people knew where I was. Uh, So, because I thought I was going to be in the hospital for like a day and come home. (laughs) Ha ha ha. That was funny. Nope, nope, nope didn't happen like that. But the people that did come to see me, I know loved me very much. And I needed someone to talk to because I was crying all the time in the hospital because I'm there alone. Like I'm not in an eating disorder ward. I'm the only one with an eating disorder. My roommate's a 95 year old patient with a broken neck and dementia. So I call it baby psych where I was. I wasn't on full psych, mini psych. I kind of just kept to myself, but we'll go into those stories another time. 
They're good stories too. So when I came home and I had gained some weight in the hospital, um, I was doing pretty good after that, but I went back to my eating disorder. So when I started eating disorder recovery, December 30th, 2022, I locked myself in a room and didn't want anyone to see me. I went nowhere. I took my kid to school. If I had to go to the grocery store, I would. Other than that, I stayed in my room and I cried and cried and cried and cried. I pretty much Howard Hughes it. If you don't know who that is, look him up. There's a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. Go watch it. So I just, no, I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't want to hear from anybody. I didn't want anyone making comments about my body because I'm super embarrassed about my body. And then that can only last for so long. So I think we went to my parents' house for dinner and I was just like, please just don't ask me anything. Like, please don't make it a comment about my parents. Don't say anything. And my mom's like, okay, but I can't promise that your dad won't. And to be fair, my dad has Alzheimer's. So when he saw me a month into recovery, I had already gained a significant amount of weight. And I had edema, so I was all puffy. But I remember my dad hugging me and he's like, don't do that again. And I was like, oh, okay. Ah! <laughs> so that didn't hurt my feelings. But when I could go out, well, then my uncle died. So then we went to a funeral. That was Easter Sunday. And my cousins, no one really said anything to me. I'm very close with my one cousin. And he knew what was going on. Well, everyone knew what was going on, but I don't think anyone knew the extent of it. He was the only cousin that knew where I was. And when I was in the hospital. And he didn't say anything. He hugged me and was so happy to see me. However, one day, because I have to get blood work done and an ECG done every two weeks, that that is the repercussion of my eating disorder, people. I'm bulimic and anorexic, and there is repercussions on my body that I will have to live with for the rest of my life. I've been getting my blood work done and an ECG every two weeks since I got out of the hospital, July, July 2022. A year and a bit. I don't know how I have blood left in my body. Apparently they say I do. And my heart's still ticking. So yay me. But when I went and got my ECG done. And this was like February. And the girl doing it. They ask you your height and your weight. I tell her I'm five foot ten. I say my weight. No, I'm not going to say it on here. And then she's like, oh, why are you here? And I was like, well, I have an eating disorder. And she looks at me and she's like, well, you don't look like you have an eating disorder. No, keep in mind, I've been in recovery. My stomach is bloated. I look pregnant. I do. And I'm like, no, I have an eating disorder. And she's like, well, what kind of eating disorder do you have? And I could feel my back start to sweat. And I'm hooked up to all those electrodes. If you ever got an ECG, right? Like they put like, everything all over you, right? And you're naked from the top up with a little paper freaking blanket over you. And I'm trying to explain this to her and it was going nowhere. And I left there in tears, in tears. And I came home and I told my husband and he's like, nope. So we actually phoned and complained. And I was like, no, I don't want to. And he's like, nope, we're going to do this. Because honestly, in that moment, I wanted to run back to my eating disorder. I'm like, this is bullshit, right? And thank God I did tell my husband and I didn't sit with those feelings because I could move forward from that. He's like, no, no, we're calling, we're complaining. And they did get back to me um, and say, hey, we're sorry, and that will never happen again. And then they had some big, huge meeting. I think it was across Canada at uh, Life Labs. <laughs> uh, so that's because of me. If you work for Life Labs, you're welcome. And then uh, it happened again on 
Tuesday. No, last Friday. Sorry. It's t- last Friday. It happened again. I had a different tech. Asked my height and weight. I told her. And then this time it was. Why are you so skinny? How are you so skinny? And it wasn't meant as mean. I think she wanted to know my secret. And I just ignored her. I just laid there and ignored her. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And, you know, sometimes people are going to say stupid shit. I went to another uncle's funeral in November. The minute I walked in my parents' house, my mom and aunts were talking about their bodies and the body shaming that came out of their mouths. If it was a drinking game, we would have been dead in one second. Like, I couldn't believe it. I'm literally sitting at the kitchen table. And for those who can't see me listening to Spotify, I got my hands over my ears, rocking myself back and forth, just saying, all food's good food, all food's good food, all food's good food, all food's good food. Because in November, I was still having a hard time in November going through this eating disorder recovery. And I remember seeing this charcuterie board and I was like, oh yeah, that looks really good. And I love cheese and crackers and pickles. Love. And I thought I can do this because the food was in the dining room and no one was really watching me. So I was like, oh, because I have a problem with people watching me eat food because that's the way I am. And I could go in there and feel safe. But then all the food came out to the kitchen table. But I still did it. I took down that security board like I was going to war. Plus, my aunt brought these candied jalapenos. Oh, my God. So good. Paid dearly for it, let me tell you. But so good. And I was so proud of myself in that moment. These I'm hearing conversations that I do not want to be hearing right now because every five seconds they want to rag on themselves. I'm looking at my mother like she's got five heads. I'm like, do you understand what you're saying right now? I'm sitting right across from you, right? And then I'm thinking I'm too sober for this house. Get me out of here. And the point of this mishmash story is people are going to say shit to you and you're just going to have to learn how to deal with it. Because it's not anyone else's problem to go around you and your feelings and your buttons. And what's going to hit a button and what's not going to hit a button. Life's tough, man. Like you're going to have to toughen up to get through this. And yes, it sucks. And it's okay to take yourself out of a situation and leave. But for the whole world around you to spin on a dime just for you and your feelings is not going to happen. So we're just going to have to take it like a champ and try to find ways on how to calm our nervous system and calm ourselves down after and in a healthy way and go from there. But yeah, stupid people say stupid things. You can't fix stupid. It is what it is. 1% better every day. Take care of you. Hey there, my little gaffers, and welcome to 1% Better with Heather. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about how to love your body through your eating disorder recovery. Here's the deal. If you are here for a motivational speech, man, you're in the wrong spot. I am here to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This was hell for me, and it's probably hell for you. Gaining weight in eating disorder recovery sucks the big one. Now, I know someone would say, well, isn't that the point of recovery? Yeah, no, I get it. However, I would like to recover and stay in the body that I like. It does not work like that. It, oh God, I would hate waking up in the morning. I'm just not even gonna lie about it. I hated look at myself in the mirror. I couldn't stand seeing my face puff out, my stomach extend, the voice, my eating disorder voice slick telling me, no, it's not too late. Just run back, just run back. I would cry, ball my face off, cry 24 hours a 
day. I locked myself in a bedroom and wouldn't come out. I was so embarrassed. I didn't want anyone to see me. The only time I left this house in my bedroom was to go to group, which we'll talk about in another episode because I have thoughts on that. And then if I had to go to the doctor, that was it. I did not. No, absolutely not. I did not go out for fun. I didn't want to be seen. If I had to go to the grocery store, I made sure like I was invisible and I live in a smallish town. Trust me, you can't go to the grocery store without seeing somebody that you know. And I would just put my head down, put my hood over my head and run through that thing like an Olympic event. And I couldn't. The embarrassment was so much. I had to put towels over the mirrors because I couldn't look at myself anymore. And this, it was so difficult. It was so difficult. And I would watch TED Talks and watch these people pour their guts out and say how much they love their body and everything else. And I'm thinking, well, that's great for you, but not for me. I don't want to change. I don't want to gain weight. And that would just upset me more. And I would yell and scream. And I'm like, well, you guys are full of shit. No one loves their body like this. There's no way. There's no way in hell. You're just up there because you're getting a paycheck. You're just getting a paycheck from endorsements and all this other jazz. When you think like me in those moments, you are just feeding your eating disorder. You are still so sick, even though you're eating and you think that you're getting better. One day I had to go to group therapy and we watched this movie and it was called Behind the Before and After and it's by Body Love Society. So look it up on YouTube. It's about half an hour. I inconsolably bawled through this documentary, cried, and I came home and I watched it again. And I watched it again. And I watched it again. This one helped me. I hope it helps you. Now, into a year and almost one month into recovery, how do I feel about my body? It's every day is different. Every hour is different. Every minute is different. I have good days. I have bad days. The bad days are fewer and far between. But there are certain things that if I'm in a, like looking too much backwards, if I'm looking at old photos or I find some old clothes and don't tell me to throw them out and don't tell me to not to look at old photos. It is what it is. All right. So that's how I heal also. I don't want to go back there. I know this in my brain. My brain is nourished enough that I know that my old clothes that I used to call my skinny jeans are now my sick jeans. I am not meant to fit in those clothing, that size of clothing. No. So if I keep it around, it's almost like, no, we don't go back because I feel, and this is how I process things, if it's in front of my face, I know not to do it. If I got rid of it and never looked at that stuff again, I would backslide. I know I would. Everyone processes differently. That's how I process. I can obviously look in a mirror now and not cry, but there's certain things that come with recovery that, you know, I don't like. I don't like my thighs. I don't like, and I can't believe I'm doing this on camera, I have bat wings now. Bingo, bingo wave. A lot of people do. It's not just me. But, and I'm getting better with it. I'm getting better with it. But it's stuff like that destroys me. 
working on your self-esteem is like working any muscle. It's like riding a bike. You wouldn't start your little baby on a mountain bike and push him down the biggest hill that you could find. No. Start at, you know, a little tricycle. And then we move up to training wheels. And then we take off one training wheel. And then eventually, we'll ride the bike. We'll probably fall a couple of times. But eventually, we'll get the balance of it. And this is where I am now. I'm trying to find the balance. I do my best to say nice things to myself. And again, I'm working on that. So I invite you today to go watch that documentary behind the before and after. Look at yourself in the mirror and just give yourself a high five. Just a high five. Just say, you showed up today. And showing up to battle. Shit, you're already like 98% there, right? You showed up. That's a lot. And slowly, I guess, we become 1% better every day. That's all for this episode of 1% Better. To continue the conversation, head over to our website at www.1percentbetter.ca, where you can access more stories and resources. We'd also love it if you subscribed and left us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And remember, friends, progress takes patience, perspective, and sometimes a little help from people who get it. So be kind to yourself and others as we work to get 1% better every day. We'll see you back here next week.